Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the area of verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Paul and Barnabas have gone to Jerusalem at the insistence of the believers at Antioch to discuss a very important question. The question of whether or not Gentiles need to be circumcised as well as believing in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And I've pointed out in past videos, if it's accepting Christ plus picking up a rake, you've added something to the... Uh, finished work of Christ. Paul went up by revelation, presented before the council at Jerusalem. Uh, James and Cephas and John were there. Where the other apostles uh, were, we're not sure. And he presented to them the gospel that he preached, not with any concern that the gospel might be wrong. His concern was that he might not be able to properly lay this before these apostles at Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit begins this epistle by laying out the credentials of Paul as an appropriate apostle. He was every bit as much an apostle as those who had known the Lord during his earthly ministry. Uh, we've now seen that as this was presented to them, false brethren came in attempting to spy out their liberty that they had in Christ and insist that Titus be circumcised. And they gave place uh, to these false brethren, not for an instant, because of the truth of the gospel. What was important was the truth of the gospel. That was vastly more important than these brethren getting along. Please keep that in mind as I move forward here. That's something that has virtually disappeared from the Christian community. What is important is the truth of the Word of God. What seems to be important in the liberal philosophy that pervades Christianity today is that it's all important that we be one in love and communion. We don't discuss doctrine because that becomes divisive. And of course it should. And it's the, it's the truth of the gospel that is supremely important. Well, we found out that the council at the apostles, of the apostles at Jerusalem, they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision had been committed to Paul as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter. These are not two gospels. It's the same gospel. It's a different area of responsibility. Paul's commission was primarily to Gentiles. Not that he never talked to a Jew, but it was primarily to Gentiles. Peter's commission was primarily to Jews, but they preached the same gospel. It is astounding how many Christians read that verse as though Peter had one gospel and, well, Paul had another gospel. And neither should you conclude from the verse that Peter is saying to the Jew that you have to be circumcised as well as believe. That is not what he was preaching. That's, that's not what he was preaching. He lived, as, as we'll see, according to the Gentiles. He fellowshiped with the Gentiles. And we'll look at that in just a moment. They preached the same gospel. The area of responsibility was what was different. Verse 8, I believe, is a parenthesis. He that accomplished mightily in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same, the same God accomplished mightily in me toward the Gentiles. And the Greek carries with it the idea of completing what God intended to complete. There wasn't any lack in Peter and there wasn't any lack in Paul. Verse 8, I believe the Holy Spirit had Paul in order for you to not get the idea that Paul's a much better guy than Peter. That the outstanding apostle is Paul and Peter, well, he wasn't really very much. And, you know, he always kind of put his foot in his mouth 
I think the verse clearly says there that God accomplished exactly what he intended to accomplish in Peter, and he accomplished exactly what he intended to accomplish in Paul. It is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Christians lead virtually defeated lives because they don't believe that. I think it's wonderful to know that God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What he did in Peter, it's what he did in Paul. Verse 9, when James, Cephas, and John, who seem to be pillars, I do not believe the Holy Spirit here is demeaning James, Cephas, and John. In the eyes of the people in Jerusalem, they were apparently outstanding apostles. In fact, if we look behind the scenes, we realize that the brother at Antioch had sent Paul and Barnabas and Titus had gone along to Jerusalem to settle this question, to settle it once and for all. Therefore, they must have held these apostles in high regard. And that's the basis of Paul's argument here as the Holy Spirit leads him to pen it that these are the people that you had great respect for. They seem to be pillars. They perceived, the text says, and this is the word gnosko, experiential knowledge. It's more than just knowing. Now, up in verse 7, it was oida, perfect knowledge. They intellectually accepted the fact. Now they intimately perceive the fact. It's part and parcel of what they believe. They perceived the grace that was given to me, the text says. And you'll notice that here, grace is inseparably connected with the truth of the gospel. I don't know how many Christians understand grace. You know, if you add anything to grace, it's not grace. The Holy Spirit makes it very, very clear that adding anything, anything to grace makes it works. And adding anything to grace carries with it the indication that you deserve a reward. But grace, dearly beloved, is the free, absolute, unmerited favor of God, and that's the truth of the gospel. God has nothing against you. He has redeemed you by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is astounding in the grandeur of that truth how many Christians pin their redemption on human action. Someone handed me a, an article just tearing apart what Romanism adds to the truth of the gospel and pointed out that the gospel is all you have to do is believe and be sorry for your sins. Well, if you tack that on, you've tacked something else on. You might as well say all you have to do is, is be water baptized, uh, join a church, uh, go to prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. I, I don't know, just put something in there. You know, you've got to be, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not enough. But the minute that you put something in there, it is no longer grace. That's why the Lord confused his hearers. The Lord points it out that if you were my sheep, you would believe. Modern Christianity says, if you believe, you'll become his sheep. And folks, that is ant absolutely anti-biblical, and yet it is, it is the belief of the predominant number of pro professing Christians today. They perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul says. Paul did not deserve it. Peter did not deserve it. You and I do not deserve it. And that grace included the truth of the gospel, which is Jesus paid it all. God did it all. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. All right, you, you can say that they shook hands or they bumped fists or they slapped shoulders, whatever you want to do today. 
in order that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision, not with a different gospel, with a different area of activity, a different area of responsibility. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was forward to do. The word forward there may be in some of your translations translated diligent, diligent, okay? The Lord over and over again was responsive to the poor. One of the characteristics of the Messiah. When John said, tell us, do you be the Christ or do we look for someone else? What did he say? What did he say? The poor have the gospel preached to them and were to be ready at all times to give aid to those in need, especially to those who were of the household of the faith. And the word forward, to give due diligence to do it. The next place that we see the word, I mean, I mean there are several offsprings of the word, but the next place that we see it is in Ephesians. You know, you have Galatians, then Ephesians. And here we're to give diligence, due diligence, for the unity of the Spirit, the unity of the truth of the Word of God. We have tremendous pressure today for unity of fellowship. You know, if we just disregard any doctrinal differences, we could all just get along great. And wouldn't that be wonderful? Actually, it wouldn't. And we are to give diligence to the truth of the Word of God. The truth, the truth of the Word of God. In 2 Timothy, we see it. We are to study, to show ourselves approved, workmen that need not to be ashamed. And it's the same word to give due diligence to study the Word of God, to give diligence to the Word of God. In Hebrews 4, we're to give diligence to enter into the rest that has been purchased for us by Jesus Christ. Rest. Rest. Not, well, Steve, I haven't done enough. I haven't prayed enough. I haven't given enough. I haven't worked enough. I haven't gone to the mission field. I've never gone to the mission field. I don't witness that often, whatever. Think of it, folks. There remains a rest for the people of God. We ain't working our way into heaven, okay? We have entered into His rest in Christ Jesus, His finished work. We rest in Him. We rest in Him. In 2 Peter, we have the word that we are to give due diligence to add to our faith, virtue, and temperance, and so forth. We're told that we're to give due diligence to make our calling and election sure that is not any lack in what Jesus Christ did. That's a lack in our understanding. And we're to give due diligence to make that calling and election sure by taking at face value what God has declared to be true. Not what man says, but what that book says. The last place the word occurs is, is 2 Peter 3.14. We're to give due diligence to be found in peace. I don't think that's peace with one another. I think that's peace with God. Therefore, having been justified through the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. Most of the Christians that I talk to don't have peace with God. Now they worry about what God might have against them, what they might face, Folks were to give due diligence to be found in peace. Paul here says that he always gave due diligence to remember the poor. And we know from the book of Acts that he engaged in taking a great offering to the poor at Jerusalem. Now all of a sudden, there's a change. But when Peter was come to Antioch. If you look at the Greek, this is a total break in the immediate chronology of the moment. 
This Peter coming to Antioch precedes this meeting in Jerusalem that follows it. That is, we're not to believe here that the chronology now continues. He had this meeting at Jerusalem, and then they turned around and they went back to Antioch. And then Peter came. The language is such that Paul is, well, the Holy Spirit is having Paul recount an experience that he had with Peter before this council meeting at Jerusalem. The argument is not whether it was before the meeting or not. The argument is, did Paul say these things to the people at Jerusalem? Or is he just writing them uh, to the people who were in the churches of Galatia? And I don't really know whether this came up in the meeting at Jerusalem. It, it may well have been uh, that as these apostles discussed together, Paul reminded them of his meeting with Peter at Antioch that had preceded the meeting in Jerusalem. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Let me point out, uh, and something that I, I imagine you all know, this is the only place in the Word of God in the New Testament well, in the whole Word of God, for that matter, where one apostle ever corrected another. The only place. Now, I'm not suggesting that there were not conflicts between the apostles, but the only confrontation that we have doctrinally between the apostles is right here. And it's an interesting meeting between Peter and Paul. First of all, Peter was one of the leaders of the apostles. No question about that. One of the outstanding apostles. I think that we demean Peter a lot more than we should. Quite a guy, Peter. Fabulous guy. When Peter was come to Antioch, I st stood against him face to face because he was to be blamed. And the idea is that he did this publicly. But what Peter did is such a simple little thing. It doesn't deserve this conflict. Brother, and stop and think for a moment. I'm playing devil's advocate now. Think what it meant to those believers at Antioch to see two apostles in conflict. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better if you didn't say anything to him at all, Peter? Uh, you know, Paul, Paul, keep your mouth shut until you have a a moment in private and then and then go and discuss that you know what you're what you're doing here is sowing discord among the brethren and that's a terrible thing and I've heard that all my life dearly beloved to say it's a little thing is to make the word of God worthless it is a big thing it isn't Peter's action. It's that that action teaches that Jesus Christ is not enough. I withstood him from the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them, fearing them, which were of the circumcision. Underline that. Fearing. Fearing. Before they came, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. He was fellowshipping with the Gentiles when these people came from Jerusalem who were obviously Jews. And they came from the council in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Peter apparently felt it would be wise no longer to eat with the Gentiles. So he separated himself for what? Doctrinal reasons? No. Fearing them that were of the circumcision. Big difference. Okay? 
Peter's action was not based on the purity of the Word of God, the truth of the Gospel, the grace of God, or any of those areas where his action would be correct. His action was based on fear. He was afraid of what somebody else might say. Very, very characteristic of Christians. Doctrine, folks, was meant to divide. We separate on moral grounds. I mean, I'm, I won't go in a beer joint with you. I, I, I will listen to your foolish ideas about the Christian life. Peter's action was based on fear. He was afraid of what somebody else might say. Well, if I told him what I really believed, they'd probably throw me out of the church. I've had more than one minister tell me that, 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 that if he preached what he believes the Bible really says, I don't know if you can believe this. If I really preach, Steve, what the Bible really says, I'll lose most of my congregation. Awesome, I don't have to cry that more people don't watch these videos. <laughs> Look, folks, if the God that I worship does not have the ability to get people to listen to me on YouTube, then I'm not going to worship Him anymore. Uh, what kind of a pathetic God is that? God has those here that He wants to hear. And I don't have to worry about that. If the God that I worship cannot get someone, any place in the world to hear me, if He wanted them to hear me, then He's not God. And of course, what I get all the time is, well, you know, you're slacking in your responsibility. Folks, my responsibility is to proclaim the truth of the Word of God. Your responsibility is to search the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. I think you have another responsibility, and that is if they're not so, you should tell me. I want to know the truth of this book. I am not interested in numbers or size or brownie points or, or S&H green stamps, but I am interested in the Word of God. Peter withdrew for fear. I could really respect him if he withdrew for doctrinal reasons. The question is, is he going to fellowship with Gentile believers or not? If he doesn't fellowship with them, the inference clearly is that they're not part of the family and the household of God. And the reason that they're not part is there's some lack, and that lack is probably circumcision, in this particular case at least. And so his fear leads to terrible doctrinal error so he was withstood publicly to the face. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas, the friend of Paul. Keep in mind, Barnabas, he traveled on missionary journeys side by side with Paul. It isn't long after this council in Jerusalem that Paul and Barnabas separate Now you don't want to blame Barnabas. Barnabas was no Peter. Peter was one of the original apostles. He had spent three to five years with the Lord in the Lord's earthly ministry. He was there at the resurrection of Christ. He preached one of the first gospel messages in the book of Acts in Jerusalem itself, where it could have cost him his life. He'd been in prison. In fact, one time he was in prison. They were praying for his release and God released him. And the people doing the praying didn't even believe that he was free. So Peter isn't a nobody. Clearly, Barnabas could say, well, I don't know, but if Peter does this, maybe I ought to do it. You know, it's a... It's astounding that a little bit of fear on Peter's part would lead all of these other Jews, including even Barnabas, to dissemble with him. Why aren't people that eager to follow the truth? You know, if Peter spoke the truth, why wouldn't all these other Jews dissemble with him? But they wouldn't. 
they would have turned against him. I don't want to make something out of that that maybe I shouldn't make, but I want you to think about it, folks. If what you preach in the Word of God is received with great shouts of hallelujah and, and shouts of joy by the multitude, is, it is virtually invariably wrong. The crowd folks will always, always follow the error eagerly, but seldom, if ever, follow the truth. If the situation were reversed and Peter stood staunchly for what he believed, the other Jews probably would not have followed him in that. That's why Paul says that preaching the gospel makes him the filth and the offscouring of the world system. Spent, spent time in prison, beaten. What's he doing? He's proclaiming truth. You'd think that he'd be a hero, but... He's a criminal. In Romans 9, thou wilt say then unto me, the response is argumentative when it's truth. They just walked away with him. What, he's, was, what he was doing was wrong. It's doctrinally wrong. It blasphemes the finished work of Jesus Christ. It undermines what was preached in the name of Christ and its basis its basis was fear. And yet the other Jews, I mean, what the Greek says is that all of the other Jews at Antioch, all the other Jews at Antioch, loipos is a Greek word for the remainder. The remainder of the Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with that thought. All of this based on fear. Not a courageous declaration that Jesus Christ died in your place that he was buried, and that your sins were carried away, removed as far as the east is from the west. He wrote that he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead because you're made righteous. And therefore, being made righteous, we have peace with God. One little action was a mighty message against the truth of the gospel. Paul says, I immediately saw that they did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. What was at stake? Not the fellowship and the unity of the group in Antioch. Not, not love and, and sugar. You know, so we all get along. We don't have difficulty. No. What was at stake, dearly beloved, was the very truth of the gospel itself. And so I said unto Peter publicly, you know, why not do it privately? Because what Peter did was public. Had it been private, Paul would have spoken to him in private. But what Peter did was in public before the, the entire group at Antioch. And therefore, the whole group should hear the truth. I said unto Peter before them all, and that's a first class condition, if thou being a Jew, and you are, that's, that's the first class condition, live after the manner of the Gentiles. What does that mean? That means that Peter learned his lesson on the housetop, Joppa. Lord, never has anything common or unclean passed my lips. And, and what did the Lord say? Call not that common or unclean which I have cleansed. That included the Gentile. And once again, the truth of the gospel is they weren't cleansed because they did anything. They were cleansed because God did it. That's the truth that people stubbornly resist today. It's what God did through Jesus Christ. That's what cleansed them. And Peter learned that. Peter learned that. Peter didn't worry about those things. And he learned that lesson when the Lord told him that he had done the cleansing. So he lived after the manner of the Gentiles. That's the way he lived. That was Peter's normal life. Now all of a sudden, and you don't live according to the Jews. You don't live anymore after the law. The Sabbath day's journey didn't bother Peter anymore. The constraints of the law were no longer present in Peter's life. 
why are you then, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? You know, would, would Peter's answer be, I'm not compelling them? Yes, you are, Peter. Because you wouldn't fellowship with them anymore. Because they didn't keep the law that you didn't keep. <laughs> you yourself. You were in great agreement with them. And then some people come down from Jerusalem and you suddenly act as though Christians ought to obey the Jewish law. So what you're doing is compelling these Gentiles to live as do the Jews. Come on, Peter. But look at the next verse. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. It wasn't because Peter didn't want to hurt the feelings of the people from Jerusalem. Peter was scared. He was afraid of them. That's what the Holy Spirit says. Peter was living like he was something better than those Gentiles. You know, like, like you deserve more of God's love, God's fellowship and communion than, than your brother or your sister in Christ does, you know, because of your action. Though, it, though it, it may have been innocent on your part, that it teaches that these Gentiles are sinners and you're not knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. We can't get into that verse. That's a, that's a, that is a tremendous verse. We'll spend time on it, Lord willing, next week. Folks, I urge you to realize that we're justified by what Jesus Christ did, not by what we believe about it. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for your word, for the privilege and the opportunity that we've had to think about it. May the Holy Spirit take what's been spoken, filter out the foolishness, but open our hearts to the truth. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.